Good morning, folks. T. Blake Braddy here, author of the Rolson McCain series. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the third story in Stephen King's new book, If It Bleeds. And the story itself is called If It Bleeds. Disclaimer, there will be spoilers in the story. I'm going to talk about it from soup to nuts. And so if you haven't read it or haven't read the stories involving the main character, Holly Gibney, that includes the Bill Hodges trilogy and last year's The Outsider, then maybe go read those and come back to this one. But if you've read those stories and know exactly who Holly Gibney is, we're going to dive right in. Okay, so this story, uh, If It Bleeds, is another Holly Gibney story. So it's going to involve a lot of the characters from the Bill Hodges trilogy, uh, including Jerome, Jerome's little sister. It's going to include Holly Gibney's mom, uh, whose name is Charlotte, and uh, Pete is going to be in this one. So it's another, it kind of combines the worlds of Bill Hodges and The Outsider. So what happens is that you have a an outsider as we come to learn blow up a middle school and it's horrifying like as a parent it's my absolute worst nightmare and so in the wake of this super violent action holly gets involved because she sees something that seems a little off in the security footage that's shown on tv and so over the course of some investigation, she begins to think that this is one of them. And so she starts to do some detective work and meets up with kind of an older guy who has evidence of um, this, these sorts of things happening before because he's followed the path of TV anchors. And so let me take a sidestep to discuss this plot thread. And so <clears throat> what happens in the story is that Holly believes that it's the local, the first guy to show up on the scene for this bombing, a guy named Chet Ondowski. And he shows up. She thinks that he may be a part of it because there's, in the first video he filmed for like his stand up, there's like some sh schmaltz on his face. And so it's kind of a, a strained plot thing, but it works. And so she thinks that he might be one of them. And so she follows this guy, Chet Undowski, and figures out through talking to this older guy that Chet Undowski is the persona for this outsider. And the old guy has all this video footage of outsiders being um, at the scenes of major crimes over the last 60 or so years. A slightly altered face, but basically the same thing. And so the the implication and what you know what they kind of the conclusion they come to is that this thing is a scavenger. It feeds off of the pain and suffering of other people. You know, Hindenburg uh, crashes and shootings, they mention specifically the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. I believe it was in Orlando. And so this, this thing is just kind of a, a, a scavenger of pain and suffering. And so Holly kind of has a, a cat and mouse with this, this Chet Undowski outsider thing and shapeshifter. And so um, almost like a Wendigo, but uh, she pretends to uh, to try to blackmail it for some money, and then there's a huge culminating scene that involves Jerome, who's in the series. Uh, he's in the Bill Hodges books, and Jerome's little sister, whose name escapes me. I don't think it's Samantha, but that's the name that's sticking in my head right now. And so, long story short, Holly manages to kill this outsider. Things are put back together. And so I'm going to talk about it in depth. That's the basic plot of the story. And so <clears throat> these outsider stories, I think they seem to fit with today's just rip from the headlines, the sense of nameless terror that we feel. Uh, I'm, get, I'm not, this is not a political video, but 
I think with regards to violence, there's this sort of like shifting sense of violence and it's not like in the 1970s and 80s where it's like you know like the Ted Bundy serial killer thing the the sorts of violence we see today it seems to be replicatable by lots of people and yet no one is kind of nameless but also named it's also the way that we kind of see the internet right like the kinds of violence that we feel on the internet even though it's a myriad of people, it's all kind of the same opinion, if that makes any sense, when you have criticism or when something goes against you. And so <clears throat> I think that the, the idea of this kind of villain, the outsider, the shape-shifting kind of creature actually kind of fits with what we think about today, right? And so I like these stories. Uh, it's kind of an old, it's kind of an old, uh, theme of like a unknowable shape-shifting creature that that kills things um the difference the difference in this story from previous stories is that this chedondowski before he just fed off of the scenes of tragedies but this with blowing up the middle school he actually engaged in the act so he wasn't just there to feed on the suffering, he actually blew up the school so that he could feed. He was hungry, as he says at one point. And um, so what that says is that, you know, he's changed his methods. And it also shows that the nature of evil is that when it, when it cannot feed off something that's already extant, it has to create the conditions so that evil can take hold. And Holly, just flipping to her for a second as a character, Holly Gibney is, she's a great character because she was, she has changed so much over the course of the books. And if you follow the thread of, you know, Mr. Mercedes and the rest of those Bill Hodges books, you're able to see that um, she is a character who makes a lot of changes. Um, she goes from being just a, a timid, fearful, She's under the thumb of her mother and cannot sort of be her own person. This, this story, I don't know if we'll see Holly again, but if we don't, it represents kind of a nice epilogue to her story. And it kind of brings closure to a few threads in her life. Because as we start this story to discuss, you know, sort of character arc and how Stephen King's able to show how characters change, with the beginning of the story, Holly she is changing she's talking to a therapist she is trying to take control of her life but at the same time there are still elements of her life where she feels that old pull that old um, anxiety and it deals specifically with her mother charlotte and so the way the plot sort of brings us to a head is that you know she has to deal with the fact that her mother can no longer accept being like not being the main focus in her life because Charlotte was the main focus in her life for so long. Holly had to rely on Charlotte for so long. And so over the course of the story, we see Holly become a more independent person. Her struggle in this story is to become more assertive. And so that's what she does. And through her, um, sort of interactions with the outsider, she's able to exercise those demons, so to speak. And so it makes her a more complete and whole person because she's able to fend off the idea that she's not strong enough to be able to stand up to her mother. And so this battle with the outsider is really as much a battle about herself. And I think that's another reason why the outsider is such a good foil for Holly Gibney, for Holly, and just uh, just such a good villain in general, because over the course of over the course of the story, Holly is able to learn how to assert herself, because that's her kind of her last hurdle is is how to stand up and speak her mind and not falter because of her anxiety. It's actually kind of a subtle um, take on how anxiety can cripple us. And because Holly is 
outwardly a normal person, but inwardly just a mess. And she has, I mean, all the trappings of maybe some sort of OCD or even she may be on the spectrum slightly. And so, because she, she's very particular about everything. There's a scene where, you know, she watches the same show every day and she lays out six like little snack size snicker bars. She has tr problems with addiction, smoking, and so if we never see Holly again, I feel some sense of closure because um, the reason that Holly's mom is so uh, part, uh, central to this story is that Holly's uncle is being put into a, uh, a care facility. And, you know, he's, he doesn't remember who Holly is. He keeps calling her Janie, which is the character from Mr. Mercedes. And so, through all of this, she's able to kind of contend with her past in a way that she had it before. And another theme that kind of plays through the story is another one, it feels... I still haven't read the fourth story. I'm kind of doing this story by story and if it bleeds. But the fourth story, or this story, and all the others, all the three that I've read so far, have very specific references to death and old age and being decrepit and losing your, your sharpness. And I think, you know, Stephen King has always been someone who, I mean, he's been able to write about different age groups and, but he always seems to write about where he is in his life and it is sort of a reflection of maybe his inner turmoil and there's a lot of sort of analysis of the idea of getting older and getting and being at the age where things start to go away it's really it's very real. It's written in a super realistic way. Holly's uncle in this story, and then in the first one, Mr. Harrigan's phone, deals unblinkingly about death. And so, it is a kind of, and the last story, um, oh, I've forgotten what it's called, but they they all deal with death in very direct ways. And so I think it kind of shows where Stephen King is, is in his life, that you know, we don't, no matter how many stories we tell, we can't outrun that final outcome. And with this story, there are two characters whose death kind of, or whose lives are kind of encompass this idea that life is very fragile and being elderly is nothing to spit at. There's the, the guy who, I can't remember his name, I think it's Ben. Uh, Holly, the guy Holly meets up to discuss on Dowski He's on oxygen, he's very old, uh, he can't like drink whiskey anymore at all and he has to take all these pills and he's very sick and old and you know, it's a, it's, it's very dark. Like of all the things in this story, that is written with the most realism. Uh, even the explosion, the blowing up in the middle school was written since, with some sensationalism, I guess, you know, kind of not paying a nod to the idea of if it bleeds, if it, le it leads. And, but death is written about with some sort of grim knowing realism here. And so that's, that's the other thing that I think runs, if anything links all of these stories together, it's that sort of knowledge of death. And um, Stephen King is probably, I mean, he's, um, he was born in, I think, 47, 46, 47. So he's 73, maybe at this point, 72. So he sees it, he feels it, and it's terrifying, I'm sure. And so reading about it gives me palpitations about growing older, because I'm 37, I'm the inverse. And so it's a good story. I, I don't like to rate stories like it's a three out of five or four out of five, but I don't know how a lot of fans out there, that'd be something good to put in the comments. I don't know how a lot of fans out there feel about Holly Gibney as a character, but I personally love the Bill Hodges universe. I was, spoiler alert, devastated when he died in the third book. I knew it was coming, and yet I was sad. So any 
any book that or story that takes place in this sort of Bill Hodges neo-noir universe, I will accept 100% I'm in from the start. I think I like Jerome as a character. I think that there's some race is not Stephen King's best feature as a writer and I'm not blind to what's going on in the world. Again, this is not a political video, but Jerome is a complicated character. I think it there is some insecurity in the way that Stephen King writes the Jerome character, especially with the way that he plays Jerome to uh, to these fits of doing the the sort of racist old um, like racist memes or racist, I can't think of the word, stereotypes, caricatures. I, th I find it very odd to not just write a straightforward black character as though, I feel like in part it's as though, I don't know. Like I don't know where, I don't know, I don't know why he'd have a straightforward character then acknowledge a really racist past instead of just writing a, a straightforward character. Like, Maybe it's because Jerome and his family, they're a middle class family and there is no, other than what Jerome talks about when he acknowledges the, the voices that he does and everything, he doesn't, there is no sense of like stereotypical blackness to Jerome. And so maybe he was afraid of the criticism that, oh, he just wrote a middle class character. He doesn't have any like realness to him. Which as a white writer, I get. Like, I understand that. And so, I don't know why you would go to the extent of... He stopped, thankfully, I think. No, I guess he didn't. I don't remember. But, it's interesting. I think that there, there will be some stuff written about Stephen King and race in the future. I'm rereading The Stand, and the number of racist characters and the sort of brazen way which characters are racist in that, in that book... I think speaks to, I don't think Stephen King is racist, but I think the politics of it will make reading him in 50 years, for example, really complicated. So, in the end, I like the story. I like Holly Gibney, so. I think that's gonna be it. I've yammered for about 20 minutes now. If you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up, like it, all of that. And uh, I will see you very soon. I'm going to read the fourth story in uh, the If It Bleeds Tetralogy, Quadrilogy. Uh, it's called Rat, and I'm excited to read it. And I'll be back in about a week to give you another video. So this is T. Blake Braddy signing off. Bye-bye.